me. If I had to boil all my criticism of Netflix's Dahmer into a single word, that word would be perspective. Obviously, I disagreed with the perspective that making a show about Dahmer was an ethically sound thing to do in the first place. And then, in execution, I felt the show struggled to balance the many different perspectives it tried to tell its story through, often diminishing the victims in favor of the perpetrator. And as a result, it felt as though the show had very little perspective or overall value to offer its audience by the time it reached its non-conclusive ending. This new season, Monsters, the Lyle and Eric Menendez story, feels like a calculated response to this criticism. It asks a pretty daring question. What if you told a true crime story where the subject is both victim and perpetrator? While not a completely original idea, this approach, coming from co-creators Ryan Murphy and Ian Brennan, seemed like a promising step in the right direction. A story worth telling, with a clear perspective to tell it through. If the showrunners could manage to take the strengths of Dahmer and apply them here, while also doing their best to mitigate the inherent issues of the genre, I felt that this had the potential to be something really special that it might even fully realize the optimistic dream I had of Dahmer being the stepping stone to something more thoughtful and nuanced. And you know what? I can't believe I'm actually about to say this right now. Um, <clears throat> they did it. They actually did it. They made it worse in every way imaginable. <gasps> Usually, I like to start by talking about the positives, all the things that the show does effectively. The hard part here is that nearly every positive I could possibly list has one or more caveats attached to it, other than the cinematography, which is consistently excellent. Take for example, the performances. The series is mostly carried by a standout performance from Cooper Coke, but I'd still say the acting is solid enough across the board, given the awful material the actors often had to work with, and even saying that, there's still a considerable step back from the absolute powerhouse performances seen across all of Dahmer. I'd also say the music is fairly good, albeit pretty repetitive and, again, not nearly as compelling or memorable as what Nick Cave and Warren Ellis brought to the table last time. And finally, I would say that this show, in its best moments, is effective at shining a spotlight on male sexual abuse, creating a pretty clear picture of how this abuse is often ignored or even flat out denied by society, most often by the very people it directly affects. But at the same time, because the show can't seem to make up its mind on what perspective it's trying to tell the story from, it consequently undercuts its own commentary on the matter, which I'll get into later. I could go on, but the point is that it becomes difficult to compliment the show on any of its merits because it all ends up feeling backhanded. Inevitably, every step forward results in two steps backward. What really puts this show on the back foot in comparison to Dahmer, to me, is the tone. Dahmer, for all of its faults, of which there were many, still managed to be fairly tonally consistent in a way I hadn't ever seen from this creative team. Dahmer felt oppressive and sickening through and through, and I took this as a measure of good faith. It felt as though it was restraining itself from indulging in the tonal whiplash of Ryan Murphy's previous work like American Horror Story, and instead making a conscious effort to take the subject matter seriously. Monsters Menendez makes no such effort. The first leg of the show especially fully employs the usual campy, <coughs> excuse me, baroque style that American Horror Story did, to the point that it doubles back on itself and begins to feel like parody. Lyle, come down to the office and you can talk to him in person. This is important. 
I think he's on his way down. Now, I gotta ask you to stay right here. I gotta go get some coffee because I feel like this is gonna be a long night. Just don't leave, I'll be right back. I was immediately reminded of films like Funny Games, or more aptly, American Psycho. Not just because Cooper Coke recently announced he wants to star in Luca Guadagnino's adaptation, not just because Nicholas Alexander Chavez was channeling some serious Patrick Bateman energy in his performance. Wait, um, stop. Listen very, very carefully. I killed Paul Allen. And I liked it. Honestly, Doc, I don't really have any more issues that I need to resolve because the two biggest issues that I had are both dead. Right, well, that's, that's good, Lyle. Um... I always use an aftershave lotion with little or no alcohol, then an anti-aging eye balm followed by a final moisturizing protective lotion. Uh, and then I also need something, this one's really important, Bain du Soleil. Bain du Soleil, as much of that as you can get. Bain du Soleil, what is that? It's self-tanner. Mm. I killed another girl with a chainsaw. <laughs> I had to. She almost got away. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I came home and I found my, my mom and my dad. <laughs> and also not because Chloe Seveny is an actor in both. I really hope that's a coincidence. No, it had mostly, again, to do with the tone. The way it juxtaposed music and circumstance. The way it highlighted the excess and amped up the performances to create heightened soap operatic reality and the way it indulged itself in its tropes and meta-commentary to the point it felt like at any moment one of the characters was going to wink at the camera. Eric, you watched a movie and you decided to kill your parents. Most people don't do that. If this tone had been carried through the entire rest of the series, I could see a compelling argument for this being satire of the true crime genre which is an extremely off-putting way to start a story like this, especially considering how serious and subdued Dahmer was by comparison. The only things the first few episodes managed to carry forward were the voyeurism and fetishism, which, what is there even to say about that at this point? Can, can we just all agree that this is gross and weird, please? I feel like I'm going insane. And I suppose we could chalk this all up to the show attempting to tell the story as society heard it, as playing into the sensationalism and shallowness as a means to show the brothers the way the public saw them, only to go on and deconstruct that view through the rest of the series, which I think to some extent was the intention here but it goes about that deconstruction with the delicacy of a sledgehammer. In my Dahmer video, I said that narrative nonfiction, like true crime, squeezes big picture reality through the narrow lens of fictional storytelling in order to make the true story more digestible. Ian Brennan described the approach of Monsters Menendez as holding up a gem or a sculpture and looking at different facets of it. But for this video, I'd like to use an entirely different analogy. The way Monsters Menendez approaches compressing reality is by minting it into a coin and then repeatedly flipping it over and over again over the course of the story. It's a particularly binary and unsubtle approach to nuance, one that often incites confusion and contradiction rather than intrigue or insight. It first presents heads. These brothers are rich sociopaths. Then it flips to tails. They are wounded and abuse children. Then it flips back again to heads, then back to tails, over and over again, before eventually ending by flipping back to heads. The exact same approach is taken with every other character in the story. The mother is spiteful and neglectful, but she's just as much of a victim as anyone else. 
The father is a psychotic, abusive monster, but he's also a product of the cycle of abuse. Leslie Abramson defends the indefensible, but this comes from her loving motherly instinct. Dominic Dunn is a sensationalist snob of a journalist, but it's because his daughter died tragically, back and forth, over and over again, until it all comes full circle. The issue is not that all of this is necessarily unfounded or unworthy of exploring, given the information surrounding this case. The best way I can describe why this feels incredibly reductive is this. It's been said that there's two sides to every story, and somewhere in the middle is the truth. And while that phrase is not applicable to every scenario, it certainly is here because Monsters Menendez presents many opposing sides, but has no middle and therefore feels like it has no truth. What makes this so frustrating is that this was an intentional decision, and it's also one that, on paper, I can understand the logic of. Ryan Murphy stated in an interview with Tadam by Netflix that, quote, the show has a Rashomon approach where it talks about countless perspectives, and a perspective is not a lie. A perspective is an opinion, and the show has an obligation to all of those opinions. And what we wanted to do was present you all the facts, and at the end of it, have you do two things. Make up your own mind about who's innocent, who's guilty, and who's the monster. And also have a conversation about something that's never talked about in our culture, which is male sexual abuse, which we do responsibly. As I said before on the second point when it comes to a conversation surrounding sexual abuse, I think the show succeeds despite itself. But as far as presenting you all the facts and having you make up your own mind, while a noble and worthwhile intention that I would normally champion, I think the show fails tremendously because of the quote that preceded it. A perspective is an opinion. We cannot and should not pretend that this show is simply an unbiased recital of all of the facts from which one can draw their own conclusion. That's not what this is, and it never could be. Foundationally, this is a television show which uses the facts and perspectives as a basis to craft a narrative, one which is reliant on the tropes of genre which is then translated using the language of filmmaking and represented to the audience. By the very nature of its existence, it cannot be a one-to-one -one representation of fact. Normally, the point of doing all of this would be to tell the true story with a clear perspective, to allow the filmmaker to metaphorically mediate the conversation in order to say what they wanted to say about it. As Ryan Murphy put it, my job as an artist was to tell a perspective in a particular story. But overall, this show seems to want to tell its story from the perspective of an omniscient observer, which is flatly impossible. And even if we can just accept that impossibility as the nature of the beast, that still doesn't justify the way in which the perspectives are presented. Not only are they unsubtle and extremely polarized, but they often expose their narrativized design. It is a fact that the Menendez brothers met O.J. Simpson in jail. The way it is presented, though, where it's framed exactly like the Riddler meets the Joker scene from the end of the Batman, makes it seem like it's meant to be some sort of cameo to make the audience clap and cheer. And all those heads who say that we're, what, we're Serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer? Dahmer's cousins. They can eat shit. What? What is this? The Ryan Murphy true crime cinematic universe? The, am I having a stroke? It is true that an unfounded theory of an incestuous relationship between the brothers was one of many opinions that was thrown out there, but the way in which it is presented here, narratively, makes it seem like an integral part of that story because it repeatedly chooses to focus on it. It's one of the first glimpses we get of these brothers' relationship with each other. It's tasteless, unnecessary, and particularly demonizing in the context of the broader conversation about abuse the series is attempting to have. 
And yes, it is true that the Menendez brothers were narrativized by journalists and lawyers as spoiled sociopathic rich kids who killed their parents for money, but by presenting that perspective again as the opening to your narrative, you are not just repeating that, you are reinforcing that view. This show is going to broadly dictate the narrative that is constructed around this case in reality, whether it wants to or not, at least for as long as it is culturally relevant, something that Ryan Murphy is quick to take credit for, saying that this show is, quote, the best thing that happened to the Menendez brothers in 30 years because it's giving them another chance in, quote, the court of public opinion. With that in mind, what needs to be understood is that what the show chooses to focus the audience's attention toward is pretty damn important, and what we are left with here is an often unfocused mess that just sloppily flips between contradictory perspectives. And I want to be clear that, though I obviously have my own opinions on it, I'm not trying to insinuate that there's a fundamentally right or wrong way to view this case. The truth is nuanced and the testimonies are muddled, so I think it's only fair that if you are to judge the brothers' actions, the facts should be presented to you in as unbiased a manner as possible, like in a court, in theory. But this show is not a courtroom. It's a courtroom drama. Worse than that even, it's a comedy of errors. These brothers could have gotten away with it if they didn't make literally every wrong choice along the way because they're complete idiots, isn't it funny? It's also a Baroque soap opera. Do not discuss the Menendez case with anyone, especially not the tapes. You should wear that amethyst crystal I got you. Your third eye chakra's a little off. It's a crime thriller, it's social satire, but in its most defining and standout moment, it is the single greatest piece of true crime I have ever seen. <sighs> Episode 5, The Hurt Man, feels like a miracle. Much like the Dahmer episode silenced before it, this episode chooses to shift its perspective directly toward the victim and dive deep into that story. Unlike Silenced, though, it doesn't take an overly dramatized or ham-fisted approach, and by taking a different path, it, to me, not only avoids all the pitfalls that Silenced occasionally fell into, but it also manages to overcome the show it's a part of and stand on its own merit. It pulls Eric Menendez's story clearly into focus in an extremely literal way, by presenting itself through a 33-minute one-take shot that painstakingly zooms its view toward Eric. No music, no cutaways or interjections, just Eric and his story, allowing that story the breathing room it needed to be properly conveyed on an emotional level not allowing you to look away from the pain of it all. As the camera inches closer, it simultaneously pulls back each layer of Eric, giving possibly the only well-rounded personal portrait in the entire series. It is honestly one of the most stirring and devastating pieces of television ever, period. Keep in mind, I am a sucker for two characters in a room sitting and pontificating for an entire episode, but I honestly have a hard time chalking this up to personal preference because much like with Silenced, I am not alone in feeling this way, which also makes it stand as a testament to my many critiques of the show. This episode didn't need to tantalize or sensationalize or constantly reduce itself down to genre archetype. All it needed to tell its story was two people, a room, and a camera. And while that still puts it squarely within the belly of the beast, as far as still being a narrative account of the events described and ultimately exploiting trauma for entertainment, it does so with such grace and tact that I might even go so far as to say that this is the single most ethical and considerate piece of true crime that's 
ever been made, and it does it by simply telling a story with a clear perspective. I don't think it's a coincidence that this is one of two episodes in this season of the show with a singular writing credit. It focuses both its own and the viewer's attention on something specific in order to make its point, giving the audience an unflinching look at the psychological and emotional impacts of abuse, how it shapes and molds a person's entire worldview and sense of self, and how it creates a self-perpetuating cycle. To me, it perfectly toes the line of allowing for empathy without crossing into tacit endorsement. It's so good it hurts, because it shows just how seemingly simple it is to tell a story like this the quote-unquote right way. It felt so validating to see that what I am asking for isn't impossible. And while I would wholly recommend just watching this singular episode out of context, it feels like some sort of cosmic joke that this episode lands in the middle of this show. While I do want to sing the praises of the creative team for making this episode, it almost makes the rest of the show sting even worse, knowing that the team was capable of so much better than what we ultimately got. It makes this achievement feel more like a fluke, lightning in a bottle that they just happened to capture twice over the course of two full seasons. And I think it speaks volumes about priorities being in the wrong place, broadly speaking. Because while it'd be easy to rationalize the chaotic and sensationalist tone employed through the first half of the show as a necessary evil to keep people engaged, it seems clear that all of that stuff is not what the broader audience is positively responding to. And if there's one thing this show seems to be preoccupied with examining in its final act, it's how much public reception shapes perception. <sighs> much like a lot of this creative team's other work, the series completely derails itself in its final few episodes. After repeatedly flipping the coin on Jose and Kitty Menendez, the show shifts its focus to the courtroom, and in doing so, I believe, begins to examine itself in the process, intentionally or not. Dahmer was extremely prone to making meta-commentary in its second half, and Monsters Menendez follows this same formula. Then there's gonna be a movie? Eric, they're gonna make a movie about us. Who's gonna play us? The way it chooses to do this, though, I find rather interesting. Essentially, it takes the real-life feud between criminal defense attorney Leslie Abramson and Vanity Fair journalist Dominic Dunn and spins it into some sort of morality tale. Leslie Abramson is depicted as fierce but loving, fighting the good fight against injustice and misogyny, while Dominic Dunn is shown to be a gossipy moralizer whose biases against the Menendez brothers entirely stem from his own daughter's murder, and apparently his closeted bisexuality, according to Murphy. While I can't say that I have any sort of personal disagreement with the ways in which Leslie Abramson and Dominic Dunn are characterized in this show, what I need to be clear is that these are indeed characterizations, which spits in the face of the supposed goal to present all the facts and have you make up your own mind. It's a little bit hard to take that claim seriously or see this as a truly nuanced and fair take on these people's lives and careers when the show is not just clearly partial to one person over the other, but is also seemingly using these characters to make meta-commentary on the show and the controversy surrounding it. I say seemingly only because I'm sure to some this will seem overly conspiratorial or speculative, but to me, it's blatantly telegraphed by having Leslie Abramson confidently spout the aim of Monster as a series. Now, the prosecution wanted you to believe that Arnell was a monster. I wanted the jury to see that Arnell was not the monster. On the contrary. He was the victim. 
then depicting Dominic Dunn shouting the opposite talking point at the top of his lungs in an emotional outburst, complete with a cut to title, in case it wasn't obvious enough. And you, how can you sleep at night defending this monster? And when you frame these characters in a meta-narrative where they're sitting on opposing sides about the implications of the title of the damn show, and then you decide to depict one as hardworking, committed, living modestly, loving, and caring, and the other pretty squarely as either a vindictive, blubbering mess, or a snobby, gossiping fearmonger smugly expounding upon his various speculative theories over a plate of tiramisu at lavish dinner parties with his pearl-clutching cronies. Let's just say that is an unbiased observation. <laughs> it's pretty clear who you want me to side with here. Which I know sounds rich coming from the person who just spent a long time complaining about the show, not telling a story with a clear perspective. But that's exactly my point. This is maddening because it's entirely contradictory to the aim of the show. There was a moment in episode 7 that really rubbed me the wrong way the first time I saw it, and it was this conversation between Leslie Abramson and Dominic Dunn near the elevator. Dunn insinuates that Leslie fabricated the abuse as a defense strategy, to which Leslie responds by telling Dunn, You know what, Dominic? I am very sorry about what happened to your daughter. That man should not have walked free, and he wouldn't have if I had anything to do with it. But you should realize he gave you something. He gave you a career and a f***ing point of view. For that, you should thank him. Now, I'm more than happy to be proven wrong down the line, but I really tried and could not find any evidence of this conversation taking place. And believe me, Dominic Dunn loved referencing his conversations with Leslie in his articles, especially if it made her look bad. And I think that saying, you should thank the person who killed your daughter, definitely would have come up somewhere down the line. But according to Dunn, conversation between them ceased fairly quickly into the trial, so as far as I can tell, this is a hard-hitting but ultimately fictionalized line. And while this interaction does get flipped on its head a bit by the end of the episode, its inclusion still really begs the question, if Leslie Abramson never said this to him, why is this line of dialogue here? To me, it feels a little too eviscerating to simply be for character conflict. It feels personal, tearing down Dunn's legacy beyond the screen. Again, that's a bit speculative, I apologize, but sometimes lines like that one just stick out like a sore thumb in the context of a show that's so willing to comment on itself. She has a pathological affection for guilty clients, in particular, guilty young men. That's weird. Kind of sounds like somebody else I know. At the very least, I'm more than confident that the show is using the characters of Abramson and Dunn to provide commentary on how the Menendez case was narrativized by lawyers and the media, explaining how the cultural climate surrounding the Menendez brothers in the court of public opinion greatly shaped the way in which the case played out. As sentiment soured, so did their fate, which the show sort of links thematically and even cosmically with the LA earthquakes. Just kind of feels like... Like what? Like something shifted. Which I think is a pretty contemplative subject to explore. It's often difficult to get people to really consider how much individual and collective perception shapes the world around us. How many of the things we see as absolutely cut and dry or black and white are not objective measures, but are rather based on a point of view, whether it's our own or someone else's, which is even more difficult to contend with in a court of law. Again, in theory, evidence should be presented to a jury as matter-of-factly as possible and should allow them to come to their own deliberations. But as we all know, 
that isn't how it works in reality. It's all about which legal counsel can construct the most compelling narrative, which, in high-profile cases, also relies on broader cultural narratives. But it seems odd to demonize lawyers, jurors, and the second trial in general for presenting or believing in a simplified, narrativized, and biased account of the events when this show is guilty of doing the exact same thing. You don't get to sit here and say, I, I can't believe they did him dirty like that. Like, you did that. It's worth repeating that this is not observation than deliberation. It is a show with scripts, cinematography, editing, music, and performance that is all being used to tell a story. The show itself is willing to entertain and reify every possible account, even from the most unreliable of narrators, with absolutely zero mediation. Not only that, but it is gratuitous in doing so. It graphically depicts the brothers murdering their parents in cold blood, it voyeuristically depicts homoerotic tension between the brothers, it allows theories and speculation to be pontificated on episode after episode, and even lends credibility via imagery to some of those theories, and it's willing to visualize every delusion or fantasy anyone involved ever had. The only thing it doesn't explicitly depict is the sexual abuse. And don't get it twisted, I'm not saying they should have done that, it's the one part of the show I think was handled responsibly. The point is that everything else surrounding the abuse was handled so irresponsibly that it strangely puts a huge question mark around the very thing it is supposedly trying to get us to have a broader conversation about. And sure, we're kinda having the conversation right now as I speak, but is it a productive conversation? Is it actually raising awareness of the things it claims to? Or is it just another adaptation of a long narrativized case? <sighs> It's hard to believe that a mere two years ago, I was hopeful for the future of this show and true crime in general. And while I'm still open to the idea that someday a piece of true crime television will be able to consistently handle its subject with tact, I have to admit that this show left me feeling a bit cynical. The show drags all this shit back into the streets by reductively stripping its story down and then flipping it on its head repeatedly, entertaining every point of view and casting the people involved in every light possible in an effort to turn real trauma into a bingeable roller coaster ride of streaming content for the purposes of what exactly? What is it even trying to do? What is the point of all of this? I can tell you one thing for sure, it certainly isn't to tell the Lyle and Eric Menendez story. When one of the showrunners openly admits that he's never met the Menendez brothers and has no interest in doing so because quote, what would I ask them? I know what their perspective is. Which is a wild thing to say by the way, in fact I think that about says it all. Especially considering the only person who got a genuinely thoughtful portrayal in the show believes it was made with bad intent because it made his brother look like a psychotic, idiotic predator. I could continue to recount the various ways in which the show fails on its own merit, or point out that doing all this for entertainment value is gross and exploitative, but the answer to what's the point is incredibly obvious. Money. They did it for money. True crime isn't just a genre, it's an industry. Netflix released this series and a documentary about the Menendez brothers within two weeks of each other, all around the same time as a possible resentencing. That is not a coincidence. That is a marketing strategy, and unfortunately, I am now a participant in that. A couple years ago, when I made my Dahmer video, I was an incredibly small channel with minimal viewership. I was just another morbidly curious audience member with a lot of thoughts and opinions who was overwhelmingly lucky to have said the right things at the right time, and I garnered a daunting amount of attention for it. 
but that's no longer the case. I am not just another audience member, I am now basically free advertisement. I have now captured an audience's attention who wants to see me talk about this stuff, which brings along with it a monetary incentive to do so. I never made this channel with the intention of becoming a notable Ryan Murphy hater, but that's my lot in life, I guess, and I want to be clear, my beef with Ryan Murphy is about his work, not about him as a person. I don't know him personally, so I can't make a fair value judgment on that. In fact, part of the reason I criticize his work so heavily is because, as an artist, I have the same provocative impulse that he does, and I empathize with his exhaustion at the amount of social scrutiny that has surrounded his work for the last 22 years. So it pains me even more to know that an artist of his caliber with the resources he has access to, can't get people talking for the right reasons. But the reasoning doesn't have to be right. All that needs to happen is the talking, and the bitter truth is that the more I talk about shows like this one, the more I widen the audience for them, whether I like it or not. And we can all tear the show down as much as we want, but we're still giving it publicity just by participating in the conversation, and much like the show itself, acknowledging that doesn't absolve anyone. So the question is, am I going to review Season 3, Monster, the Ed Gein story starring Charlie Hunnam? Ed Gein, maitre d' canal bar? No, serial killer, Wisconsin in the 50s. While I want to take the high road and bow out entirely, cynically, my answer is that if I haven't quit YouTube entirely by the time it drops, yes, I am going to review it. Not necessarily because I want to, but because I feel like I have to. So, in a strange way, I ought to thank Ryan Murphy and Ian Brennan for this show, because it gave me a career and a fucking point of view.